Well, g'day and welcome to MCC Online again this week. It's great to be joining with you from your living rooms, your bedrooms, hopefully not your bathrooms, uh, so that we can worship our God together online. We're going to hear from Heath in today's service, and he's going to be speaking to us from the second of his Aliens and Strangers series on living out a new life. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Heath's got to say uh, later on. I will warn you, he had a bit of a croaky voice at the time, but uh, I trust he won't be too difficult to understand. Tonight we're not going to be having our Inspiring Conversations video conference, uh, but we'll keep you informed on what's going on with that in the next few weeks. Uh, But if you're used to meeting up at that time, why don't you reach out to someone and arrange to meet in a smaller group, go out for dinner or something like that. That would be a great thing to do whilst we can't meet in the bigger group. Also some good news, this week we're going to be launching our revised and refreshed website. So if you haven't been onto our website for a while, uh, why don't later on this week go and have a look. It's mirandakong.org.au and on there you'll be able to see uh, where we can, well you can basically see this morning's service. You'll be able to download um, previous messages as well, see what our ministries are up to and uh, get a copy of the bulletin as well. So encourage you to have a look at that. Give us some feedback and uh, and let us know what you think. And uh, a big thank you to the team that's worked uh, pretty hard on that over the last few weeks as well to get it to where it is. So looking forward to seeing that uh, that launch this week. Members, don't forget this afternoon we are going to have our special church meeting. Now because of the restriction on numbers, we're going to be held over two venues. Uh, those people going to the alternate venue have been advised. So if you haven't been told to go anywhere else, come down to the church building. Uh, Remember, we are going to have to practice those COVID safe factors there, so we're going to need you to sign in, um, practice good hygiene and physical distancing while we're there. And if you have been sick during the last week or have any symptoms of cold or flu, please don't come. Just let me know um, and and we'll get the information across to you. But uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the right things and abiding by those COVID safe regulations while we meet together. So looking forward to sharing with you over the coming weeks what's going on with that and, uh, and how we'll return to worshipping together in person, hopefully someday soon. Well, not too much else from the news front, but uh, let's open our service with a word of prayer and then we'll get into singing some songs together. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you have provided us with. Thank you for the small groups that have joined together this morning to worship you and for those that meet during the week to study your word and meet in community together. Lord, I pray for those who are meeting today who may not know you as their Heavenly Father. I pray that the Holy Spirit will reach them through the words that are spoken, the verses that are read, the songs that are sung and the message that Heath will bring us a little bit later on. Please bless us as we meet today and we pray this in your Son's most powerful name. Amen. As Christians, Jesus' life, death and resurrection is the foundation of our faith. Um, So let's sing about the new life that we have in Jesus.
Christians, we need to be constantly reminded and humbled by what Jesus did on the cross. Um, And this song does exactly that. So let's sing and remember uh, the great price that Jesus paid on the cross for us. of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, 
this is the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told by you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. May the Lord bless to our hearts that reading from his holy word. Let us pray to our beautiful God. He is author, creator and redeemer of all things. Father, we come into your presence to praise you, to lift you up, to magnify your holy name. We come to ask for forgiveness for the things that have brought offence to you. Cleanse us now, we pray. Lord, your goodness and mercy endure us forever. And Lord, as we come together through live stream, we pray for all who have tuned in this day. We pray that your spirit will minister and bring comfort to those who have heavy burdens, great financial needs, those who do not know you, some Lord with no food or shelter. May you cause provision to come to bring relief to many who call on you. Lord, as we have heard from our Prime Minister of the disastrous figures of 800,000 people out of work, it brings sadness to our hearts at how this pandemic has affected the way of life of many. Lord, we ask that you would grant our government wisdom in the way that they need to deal with the many situations before them. And Lord, we pray for our ministers, Keith and Jeremy, and their families. Uphold them as they minister to the church. Guide each one to use their spiritual gifts to bring revival and growth to this your church and encourage us all to faithfully support them both. Lord, we pray for those in the leadership, our diaconate, and all those in ministry. For those who have the responsibility in planning for the renewal of all things to make this church of Jesus Christ a place to call home. And Lord, we pray now for those of our congregation, those who are ill, some Lord waiting for results of tests, a number of our people now in nursing homes with limited visitations. May your spirit be with each one. And Lord, we ask for your protection on all the people who work in the medical profession doctors, nurses and aides and carers and those working on a vaccine for this COVID-19. And with your help, may they be successful in this life-saving venture. And Lord, we praise you that with your help, this church has supported many missionaries over the years. And we thank you for those who have dedicated their lives to go to dangerous and difficult places to preach the gospel to those who do not yet know you. Keep them safe from this virus, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit you have heard our prayers. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I trust that the Lord will bless you today, this Sunday. Uh, I have a very croaky throat. I have been coughing and uh, my nose has been running, so... Um, I may not see you uh, Sunday, but I'm looking forward to sharing with you from God's Word for as long as my voice holds out. And you may hear a few things in the background. Um, the dogs are up and about, uh, cars are up and about, but I trust that you'll be able to focus in on what God has to say to each of one of us today. Last week, I spoke about the fact that there are three main approaches for those who live in exile, for those who are just passing through in this world. And the three of them were, first, that we might assimilate and become like everyone else, or that we might isolate ourselves and try to preserve what we have against our world. 
but that God calls us to be those who integrate uh, our lives with those around us. So we're in the world, as it were, but we're not of the world. That's how John the Apostle described it. How are we going to live an integrated life in the world in which you and I find ourselves, this 21st century Western world? It's a difficult question and there are no clear answers, but one of the people who is a gift to the church, Mark Sayers, who has a church in Melbourne and a ministry of understanding culture, suggests to us that the church's presence in the world and its integration could be best described into the future as being a non-anxious presence in a world of outrage and anxiety. It's actually a beautiful picture of how the church ought to be within the world in which we find ourselves because we live in a world of outrage, don't we? When anybody's individual freedoms are impinged or people suspect that something might have been said against them or against their race or against their culture or against their behaviour, there is outrage and there's no end to the vitriol that comes, uh, whether that's through formal media channels or social media or trolling or all of the other forms of communication that we have that speak about outrage. But it's also a world full of anxiety. Ironically, technology was always seen to be uh, something that would bring us comfort and would bring us security and that we'd be able to live flourishing lives. But it seems that the actual opposite has happened. I mean, we need our phones and we need our cars and we need all of these other technological devices. But instead of reducing our anxiousness, it seems to have raised our level of anxiety. And Mark Sayers tells us that that's a part of the world in which we live. In fact, reading uh, through the ABC News on COVID-19, there's been a 40% increase in people who are between the ages of 15 and 39 who have been feeling anxious and another 20% who are feeling depressed and uncertain about the future. That's the world in which we live. And I don't need to point to any parts of our world to know that outrage is a part of it as well. And Mark Sayers suggests that we as Christian people can be a non-anxious presence in the midst of this world in which we live. What does he mean by that? Well, actually, I think it's what Peter finishes his greeting with. Thank you to the Bible reading. And we've been reading uh, 1 Peter verses 1 uh, through to 12, uh, particularly verses 3 to 12. Last week we did 1 to 2. But at the very end of the greeting that Peter gives, he has this short greeting. It's a standard greeting from both a Roman and Jewish perspective that's been combined uniquely by Christians. Peter says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace, from which we get charity, is the original word, but or charis, charismatic, and peace, from which we get that word serenity. Peter says that for the followers of Jesus, who are going to live as exiles, he's asking that they would be people of grace and people of peace and people who would do that in abundance. I think that's a pretty good description of a non-anxious presence. That we as the people, both individually and as a community, would be able to live within a world of anxiety in peace. And for the Bible, peace doesn't mean a ceasing of hostility. It doesn't mean putting the rifles down. It actually has the sense of flourishing, of having everything in the right place, right relationships with each other, with God and with our surrounds being part of the community and having that sense that we have found who and what we are looking for. That's peace. And grace is almost the opposite of outrage. Grace is understanding and empathy and mercy towards those who might think differently to us and even cause us harm. And Peter says to those who are exiles living in Asia at the time that he wrote that they need grace and peace in abundance. And the reading that we had for us actually describes how that grace and peace is achieved in the Christian life. Perhaps you're someone who doesn't feel much grace. 
Perhaps you're someone who always holds grudges against people rather than forgives. Perhaps you're someone who finds it hard to be graceful when people are abusing you or uh, accusing you or ignoring you or alienating you. Perhaps you're someone who does feel anxiety, perhaps at high levels. Maybe the normal things of life have caused anxiety for you and you are lacking the kind of peace that Peter is suggesting that we have in abundance. I think today's reading gives us three very clear reasons that we can have grace and peace in a world of outrage and anxiety. The first is in verse three. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The first thing that we as the followers of God have is a living hope. Our hope is not in a political system that might bring about the kind of life that we think is the right kind of life. Our hope is not in another person who may be able to do something for us that we can't find the strength, the energy or the will to do ourselves. Our hope is not in education. Our hope is not in our friendships. Our hope is not in our ability to make money. Our hope is in something far more important and far more precious. Our hope is in a living person. Other religions have hope of sorts, but they hope in someone who is dead and not alive, or in a set of teachings, or an example of life. And as worthy as some of those might be, the point of difference for us who follow Jesus is that we follow a living, risen saviour. Our hope is not in something or someone in the past, but someone who is alive today. And we are born into a new family, a new birth. And God has done it because he is gracious. He is merciful. And we are part of his family. And so our hope is not in the things that surround us. Our bodies fail. Our businesses fail. Our relationships fail. And yet Jesus doesn't fail us. He is always trustworthy. The writer to the Hebrews says that he's an anchor for the soul. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? An anchor for the soul. We have a living hope. And so we always look forward with expectation to what God is doing because we know that Jesus is alive today. The second thing that Jesus uh, gives to us because of his resurrection from the dead, is a secure inheritance. Not only do we have a living hope, but we have a secure inheritance. Peter says it this way, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. It's an inheritance kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. What an amazing promise. What an amazing gift of God. Not only that we can have hope in a living person, Jesus, but that we also have an inheritance that can never be taken away. That's really important, particularly in times that we found ourselves in now. You know, always parents want a better life for their children. That's just normal. I want a better life for my children than I've had. And that's been true down through the centuries. And yet, there are those who may have had a wonderful life and seek to pass it on to their children. But even before that happens, it's all taken away. It can be taken away by sickness. It can be taken away by global recession. It can be taken away by violence or changes to procedures in government, dictatorships. It can be lost at any moment. Sometimes our inheritance is taken away from us. Jesus had a man come and ask him about dividing the inheritance between he and his brother. And Jesus said, you're a fool because you could spend all your life building everything that you want and yet it can be taken away. 
But here, Peter says the inheritance that God gives to us is one that cannot perish, it cannot spoil, it cannot fade. It can't be taken away. It can't rust. It can't have a use-by date. It never goes off, as it were. It's an inheritance that's kept in heaven and shielded there until the time that Jesus comes and brings his kingdom. And the inheritance is within that kingdom that Jesus establishes. Our living hope in the Lord Jesus Christ brings us into an inheritance of the king. We are his brothers and sisters and children of God through the new birth. That's an amazing promise. And so sometimes when people are losing things, losing businesses, losing livelihoods, losing employment, losing family, it can feel that anxiety and outrage is the normal course of action. But for followers of Jesus, a non-anxious presence in the midst of all of that has great power and attraction. I'm not saying that it's easy to do. But what I am saying is that followers of the Lord Jesus who have faith in him know ultimately that their hope is in Jesus and their inheritance is not in this world, but in the next. The third thing that is given to us through the resurrection of Jesus is a joyful salvation, a living hope, a secure inheritance and a joyful salvation. Look at verse six with me. It says, in all of this, you can greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wow, what an amazing passage to tell us and to finish the third thing. Not only a hope in a living Lord Jesus, not only an inheritance kept in heaven, but a salvation that is so joyful that we are literally lost for words such a beautiful description that we would love and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I don't know if you've ever seen this in the life of a person. It's often, I think, seen in children when they're given a new gift, something they were unexpecting and yet suddenly they possess. And there is that look of joy. Pets often do this, a kitten and a puppy, a rabbit, whatever it might be. And kids, they can't speak. They literally are so overwhelmed and so overjoyed, they are lost for words. Wouldn't it be fantastic that kids sometimes were lost for words instead of talked our ears off, say. But I've also seen it in adults. I've seen it in adults when something unexpected, something beautiful happens. And there are no words to express it. It's just sheer, unadulterated joy. That's the kind of joy that followers of Jesus are told that we can possess. That we can possess because we believe in Jesus and that he fills us with joy despite circumstances. At the beginning of the reading from verse 6, it tells us that there's going to be all kinds of trials. And even in the midst of trials, we rejoice. That's what a non-anxious presence looks like in a world of outrage and anxiety. It looks like joy. Joy no matter what happens. And as Peter says, there's all kinds of trials. There's health trials, which many people go through. There are relationship trials, the breakdown of a marriage, the disintegration of a family the loss of a loved one. There are financial trials. There are personal trials. Those times when we feel like no one understands and our internal emotions are boiling along and we don't understand even ourselves. And yet, Peter says, 
in all of those situations. We are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Not because the situation is good. It's not that we pretend that it's not happening. But it's because we realise that our faith is being tested. That our faith is being proved genuine. I know that was true for me when I lost my father. Now, 16 years ago. When I lost my father, I didn't know how I was going to react. You don't plan for it. You can't um, work it out beforehand. I found that my love for God and the joy I had in salvation was greater because I knew that my father also believed in Jesus and that I would see him in the future. And I was filled with joy. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't express it. But it was a great comfort. And perhaps that's been your experience in the midst of all of these difficulties. Maybe even in hospital, suddenly finding yourself laughing with joy or singing for no particular reason or sharing something great with another because you can. I know there's been many times when I've sat with those who are suffering whose joy has encouraged me far more than I think my presence and words have encouraged them. We can be people of joy and people of hope and people of security in the midst of an anxious world that wants to be outrageous. But we can be people of grace. Peter finishes this section by talking about the salvation that we receive. The thing that we should be so joyful about. He says that it's something that God had always planned. He had sent many in the past, prophets and angels, both of them messengers from God, some divine messengers, some human messengers, each of them seeking to work out how on earth was God going to save a people? How was he going to bring hope? How was he going to bring the kingdom of God to earth? How was he going to save those who had turned their back on him? Well, we're told that it was by Jesus and by the people who, by the Holy Spirit, spoke to the ones that received this letter and who spoke to us. There are those who spoke of the things, verse 12, that have been told to you by those who preach the gospel, the good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. There were divine messengers. There were human messengers. And now those two have been combined because the Holy Spirit has come and been sent down from heaven and resides in the people of God. And those people, Peter being one of the first, now the human and divine combined, telling people the good news about Jesus. He's the one. He's the one that brings God's presence into an anxious and outraged world. And he does it through his people. You and me have the opportunity. And we can access the joy of salvation. We can access the secure inheritance. And we can access this wonderful living hope through faith. All the way through the passage, we're told to trust, to believe, to have faith. We need to believe in Jesus. I was reading just earlier about John Wesley who wondered whether he really believed because when it came to times of difficulty, he was always anxious. He was always outraged. He wondered if he had faith and he was told, John, just preach about faith until you have it. And when you have it, you won't be able to stop talking about faith. I think that's true for you and me too. When we have genuine, real, living, breathing faith, we too will not be able to stop talking about the hope that we have, the inheritance that we already possess, and the salvation that brings us incredible joy in the midst of this world. That's what I think the church is called to do. And we, along with all of those who've come before us and all of those who will come after, have opportunity to bring the good news to others. I pray that if you don't know Jesus, that you would trust him. 
and that if you do know Jesus, that you would seek him and find him, that he may be your treasure, that he may be your all in all, as we sometimes sing, so that you might have that joy, hope and security. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your goodness to us knows no bounds. We thank you and praise you for the great mercy you've shown us in Jesus, for the chance to start again by a new birth and to have hope, to have joy, to have security, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. And we know that's possible, not in our own strength, not in our own abilities, but in the living Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking up residence in our life, that we might live for God and be his presence in the world. A world full of anxiety. Help us to be people of grace and peace. Amen. Our God is very powerful, and when he moves, there's nothing that he cannot do. Let's sing together. open to welcome us children home. Let's sing. Have you come to the end of 
for the crown.